going to now introduce to you uh, our first speaker, Isaac van der Walt. He is the Digital Scholarship and Innovation Manager for the Department of Library Services at the University of Pretoria. And in doing so, his main focus is the implementation of projects that are of strategic value and importance to the University of Pretoria and library services. Um, he was responsible, in his role, he's responsible for the strategic planning and trajectory of the makerspace, the first makerspace in academic libraries in South Africa. And uh, also he was responsible for the implementation of the first robot librarian called Libby in Africa. And that makes him um, very competent to speak to us on the topic of adopting um, the adoption of robotics and machine oriented systems that can automate and augment human oriented tasks in libraries. So we're looking forward to that. Isaac, please come forward. The floor is yours. Uh, voter. And uh, wow, people in front of me. What a fantastic thing to see, not virtual, virtual platforms. Um, thank you very much for the University of Stellenbosch as well for inviting me. I really appreciate it. And it's an honor to speak in front of you. Uh, first physical presentation in 18 months. So what I'll be talking about today is, uh, you know, robotics strangers in our midst in terms of academic libraries. Uh, yesterday we heard some information in terms of automation and um, how the world is changing, how jobs are changing, and libraries aren't any different, right? So today, sort of just to give you an overview as to what's happening sort of an international scale worldwide, and then what's happening within academic libraries and what we should be ready for any changes and so forth. All right, so I'm going to start off just by setting the scene. What is happening in academic libraries? Should we and by when? All right, and then skills development and staffing, very important topic for libraries as well. And what does the future library look like? And uh, there's some very important uh, talks coming up today that also addresses that. All right, to start off with, should we be afraid of robotics? So this is Atlas. It's a, a robot developed by Boston Dynamics. And as you can see, this is quite advanced. I can, for the life of me, not do what this robot is doing, all right? So that is quite advanced. And you'll see at the end, I mean, this is what we consider next level in terms of robotics. I would love to see Libby try this. As a side note, Libby is sleeping at the moment. Uh, <laughs> but it has come a long way, right? And it, it does create a bit of fear to people to see an Android-based robot do human-like things. You know, l just look at that. That is fantastic. All right. So should we be afraid of this? And maybe to some extent. All right. But have a look at this. All right. This is the same scene that you saw. It falls. Fantastic failure right there. All right. So it's not where we think it is. It requires a lot of skills and expertise to uh, program these robots. We need the operators to run this environment, which kind of also sets the scene as to what our role will be in future when it comes to robotics and automation. Does it mean things can do it by itself entirely? We need to be able to do this, to tell it what to do. Uh, yesterday, we heard that you, know, you have uh, general artificial intelligence in a very specific task oriented artificial intelligence. So the, the, the majority of what we see today is very task specific. It cannot do anything else uh, in, you know, instead of what it was programmed to do. Okay, so in terms of setting the scene, uh, this is the worldwide figures for uh, robotic sales and the amount of units that have been purchased. It's by the International Federation of Robotics. Right, and as you can see, the sales from 2019, 2020, and then a prediction for 2023, upwards all the way, all right? So it's not becoming less. And I think that's the reality that we have to deal with as well, is to accept that we'll see more and more robotics. I mean, uh, I'm using ourselves as an example. We already have a robot, and some of you already do. You might not know it as of yet, and I'll get to that. Uh, unit sales. Then here, every fifth service robot the supplier is a startup, and you can see there 889 service robot suppliers worldwide. Sadly, when I saw the figures, it's, it's not in the slide, there are only eight in South Africa. 
which is quite sad, unfortunately. So what happens is it becomes very expensive for South Africa to implement robotics because you need an implementation partner that imports it uh, at quite a large uh, uh, sum. All right, um, all right, and you can see there again, personal and domestic service robots also increasing. This is the uh, use of robotics. Now, when it comes to the different categories, I'm gonna explain that just now. Uh, if you look at academic libraries, we will typically look at robots that fall in the logistics category, robots for public environments, which is kind of where Libby is at, your humanoid robots. The logistics is RFID bots and so forth, which I'll cover a bit later. I hope we don't need defense robots in libraries uh, in future. All right, uh, inspection and maintenance robots also in libraries. We don't really, we, we never know cleaning robots uh, fuel robots and powered human exoskeletons. All right, so, um, ooh, wait, back. Why is this not jumping? Okay, sorry, uh, it's the same one. Medical robots, construction, demolition, and then all others in terms of it. But you can again see it just climbs and climbs and climbs. So we need to accept that robotics is coming po becoming part of many industries across the world. All right. What I want to bring into the talk today as well is we're talking about robots, but we're also talking about bots. And bots have a very, very important role to play in academic libraries. And I'll, I'll touch on that later. But in essence, a robot has a body. It's a physical manifestation of something. It's a combination of mechanical engineering and computer science, again, to fulfill a specific tasks and so forth. So you have Android-based uh, robots. Uh, and this is, this is very uh, brief, uh, you know, there's obviously more definitions of it. But uh, Android is a human-like robot, something like Libby, that has arms and a face and so forth, and you can interact with the robot. You have industrial machines uh, that can build cars and retrieve books, you know, from a shelf or whatever the case might be. Cyborg is, you know, people that start, you know, getting uh, these artificial limbs and so forth that can move and grab stuff, hands and so forth. Uh, and then, again, they are created to assist, take over, or augment human-based tasks, very specific in their nature. As an example, Libby will not be able to retrieve a book from a shelf for you. She doesn't have hands and start in the first place. She just has arms. But uh, Libby is a client service robot that can answer queries for the patrons in the library. Right, very specific in its task. It can't do anything else. Uh, then we have bots. Now, think of a bot as a robot with, without the body. It exists in a virtual space, virtual world. Now, you have code bots that assist you in terms of coding, those of you familiar with coding. Uh, chat bots, which is quite a big thing and a big movement, and um, I'll, I'll talk about that a bit later as well. We have spiders, you know, bots that crawl the web in next stuff, you might be familiar with that. Again, they're created for a specific task, uh, to take over a task or to augment a task. So let's say, as an example, a chat with a patron uh, in terms of that. And they are quite advanced now. We'll touch on that as well, very task specific. So I want to not exclude bots as part of this talk. Now, what is happening in academic libraries? So Libby couldn't get onto the plane. Here she is. <laughs> All right. So. When we look at robotics, we tend to think humanoid robot, and it's not the case. It's machines that are developed and integrated to assist with a specific task. And the examples that I'm gonna show you and talk about now are to some extent already available in libraries. Uh, and some of them are sort of now entering the domain. You know, if you think about client service robots like Libby, but some of them have been for around for quite a while. Now, self-checkout machines, you can consider it and fall that into the category. It's a, a device that is connected. If you think for IR, it's an internet-connected device that has uh, technology machines built into it to assist with the process of checking out. Right, so the idea is to automate the checkout service in the library. Then you have client service robots right there, like Libby, uh, and this is intended to, well, Libby's purpose is to answer the basic queries within the library. Where can I find books on psychology? Where are the bathrooms? What are the opening times All right, uh, of the library? 
Then you have automated book retrieval. This has been around for quite some time, but that is robotics, right? So you might have this in your library. Uh, it is a very expensive thing, but we'll, we'll get to the when and how a bit later. Next up, we have RFID bots. And remember in the beginning I said we should be afraid, maybe, but. So the RFID bots, to give you an idea in terms of how far they've come, when it comes to inventory control, uh, the public library in Singapore, I think, has quite a few of them. And it does inventory control uh, with an accuracy of 99%. And it does this overnight, day after day. So in the evening when the staff go home, the robots just roam the shelves, boop, 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 does the inventory by itself. All right. So that is available in terms of it. So if you think about how much time and human error goes into that, uh, that can overcome that. Then we have chatbots. Now, some of you might not know, but Libby is a physical manifestation of our chatbot. So Libby started way ahead of getting the actual robot. It was integrated into the robot. So what you have here is then obviously a virtual assistant that can talk to your clients and uh, answer their queries. Uh, and we've, at the University of Pretoria, we've, uh, Libby was sort of the first iteration that went out into the public. Uh, we have a new chatbot now, the student counseling uh, unit chatbot called Scooby, student counseling bot, also based on Libby. But what you can have at the end of the day is multiple bots that chat to each other and transfer chats, which I'll do a bit, uh, talk about uh, just now. All right, so we have Libby, a virtual assistant. Then you have automated circulation, all right? So some of you might have seen this or might not know about this, but this is a process where there is no human interaction in terms of bringing back or returning a book and also taking the book out. So the client goes online, checks out a book that, well, obviously there's no ebook available for that maybe. He wants to check out a book, but not just maybe a book. Maybe the library's into lending out laptops or headsets for people with online classes and so forth. They check out the device. That gets stocked by uh, the library. The client comes, taps his card, and the, the appropriate shelf opens up. The client also returns it. No interaction. This doesn't even need to be in the library. This can be by the student center or security services for that matter. 24-7, I can come and pick my book up whenever I want to. Right, so that's also a new process. Then, book drop robots, uh, I mentioned to uh, Votri yesterday. This is also in the university public library in Singapore. So these robots roam outside of the library, not in the library. So in a sort, sort of designated area around the library, there are those tracks, you can see them right there on the, on the ground. And they have QR codes telling the robot where to go next and so forth. And it finds its way back to the library. So the person with the book or whatever that needs to return it can sit at a coffee shop, oh, the robot's coming past, drop the book, and the robot will take it back to the library. All right, so without entering the library at all. In the middle here is another new thing. It's a service chatbot, which is sort of an evolution of a normal chatbot. This is the example of Max. Max is our, no, our new uh, chatbot at the university for our service management automation experience, the XS4 experience. And you can report incidents to the chatbot. It, knew, it uses uh, natural language processing to find out what you're talking about. So if I have a problem with uh, EndNote, I can say there, hi, I'm struggling to install EndNote. It will access the knowledge base to see if there's anything available to guide you in terms of how to do this. If not, it will register incident and the workflows will automatically go to the individual who is responsible for answering the queries to, uh, to that. Now, what we have with that as well is it connects to other tenants within the organization. So we have the library services. We're piloting this now uh, with my unit, but uh, we can have our tenant connected to ITS, to facilities management, and to uh, security, uh, as an example. And wherever the query is supposed to go, the client puts in one query. They do not see how it gets transferred between tenants and where it ends up. Their query gets resolved. All right, so that's a new, oh, wait. 
a new form as to sort of where we're going with that. On the right hand side, also new in libraries is maintenance robots. So you remember the RFID, RFID bots that just uh, move throughout the library in terms of uh, scanning the books. Now you have robots with UV lights that sanitize the books as they move throughout the library. Okay. And uh, again, this happens overnight. So it sanitizes the whole row or the shelf as it goes along. And I think obviously during COVID, this is very relevant uh, in terms of what we need. Now, the next is sort of to have a scan and look as to when and, and why we should do this. This is a, a prediction from the Horizon Report as to sort of the upcoming technologies that we will see in future. Now, uh, it's open for the debate because there's actually quite a lot of areas where it can filter into. But if you look at sort of robotics and automation and, and, and machines, you can see there consumer technologies, there's drones right there, there's robotics right there, uh, location intelligence, internet of things, which is, plays a big role in terms of robotics, uh, artificial intelligence, near field communication, translation, the speech text translation, and virtual assistants. Now, all of these things do not happen in isolation, they're all integrated. Uh, to give you an idea, when we talk about Libby, if I talk to Libby, I think I'm talking to a robot. What, it, what is essentially happening is it is a mechanical device which I touch the head to talk to Libby. All right, so I'm invoking the sensors in the robot. Then the microphones enable uh, or, or switch on. It listens to what I'm saying. So it's converting speech to text. It's submitting it to the cloud to dialogue flow. It uses NLP, uh, natural language processing, to match intent, and it uses machine learning to identify what is the best answer. It sends it back to the robot in terms of uh, text, in the form of text, and the robot obviously then transfers that or, or, or translates that into speech, which I'm hearing. Right, so every time you speak to Libby, that are, that's the whole stack of technologies and things that you are engaging with. So it's, it's quite adva <coughs> advanced. All right, so you can see here, uh, already in 2017, a lot that's happening. Then we look at trend adoptions, uh, also by the Horizon Report for 2019. All right, here you can see um, artificial intelligence and sort of the, the trend adoption is now, okay? Artificial intelligence. So today's robotics uses a lot of artificial intelligence and data to feed it, to tell it what to do and how to go about it. Right, so that was 2019 in terms of the predictions. Virtual assistants here as well. We have some time left. <laughs> 2022, 2023, in terms of our virtual assistants and our bots. Right, latest trends for 2020 was, again, AI machine learning, um, sort of uh, UX design, also a big thing that plays a part of it. And then 2021, again, artificial intelligence, a big, big part of that. Right, so now you might be asking, well, that answers the when. It's happening. The robots are already starting to filter down into different sectors uh, at, at institutions. And academic libraries isn't any different. We see this. The, the examples that I showed you exist in libraries already. Uh, and there are a few institutions that I'm aware of that are investigating robotics. The University of Pretoria, is looking to invest into more robotics. Uh, we already have another robot working at our medical f uh, faculty in terms of assisting with pa patient diagnostics. Uh, it's connected to other specialists abroad that can look at the information and so forth. So it is happening. Now, as I mentioned, AI is very integrated into this. Just also part of the when, this was the sort of prediction by some of the the smart people as to sort of when we can expect AI to become mainstream. Again, we see here the majority of people is like, okay, COVID did have obviously have an impact in terms of the adoption rates and stuff, but it was last year and now. So we should be focusing and thinking about artificial intelligence, automation, uh, sort of right now, it should be on your agenda when you do your planning. And then a few people that mentioned like uh, 2035, 2025, uh, which I think 
might be a little bit wrong. We're already in it. Okay, so a lot of people, especially within academic libraries, might feel intimidated by the presence of robots, virtual assistants. Also, there's the big factor of, will this replace me? Will this make my job redundant? Uh, you know, what should I do? Should I upskill myself uh, in terms of that? Now, uh, possibly, okay? But we have to know what's happening and we need to be willing to change, all right? And when I have the different skills related to this, I can see here that there's distinct categories in terms of who is, who is responsible for what and when with the robot uh, in terms of implementing it. You will have your programmer, developer, or engineer. That creates the robot, that programs the robot in terms of what it needs to do. That is not the responsibility of an information specialist. All right, so you, you don't need to become an engineer in a library to be able to work in the domain of robotics, which I think you know, adds to the fear of what people think their jobs and roles will be like. Right. You will also have your operators. Now, this is where the majority of libraries uh, and library staff will play a role. If you remember the, the earlier video of the robot crashing, we are the people that go, are going to look at the processes. We are going to look at how to refine them. We are going to operate them on a daily basis. If I use Libby again as an example, we have staff that need to retrieve Libby in the morning, switch her on, see that she's connected, can answer some of the questions, and then leave the robot to do its thing throughout the day. And that individual uh, gets to do additional or other staff, uh, uh, other work as they go along, but they simply become the operator of the robot. And if there are any issues, then obviously involve it there. And then you have the user. This is the student or the academic staff going to the library to retrieve a book or to request a query or chat on the chatbot and they need to engage with it. So when it comes to skills development, the operator of the programmer developer is quite advanced, right? This is programming, encoding, uh, engineering to some extent if you want to really delve into, into robotics and it's difficult to upskill, right? Because it's quite an advanced set of skills that you need to do. When it comes to being an operator, you're looking at sort of less intermediate type of skills to do it. So uh, the staff at Circulation by us needs to know, okay, Libby's being connected to the Wi-Fi. If it isn't, maybe I should just try this, try that password and maybe connect to a new Wi-Fi system, whatever the case might be, or it's a virtual assistant. How do I intervene into a chat that's all happening automatically? And you can do that. And then the user shouldn't be able to know advanced skills in terms of using the device or chatting to the chatbot. So that should be like, there's a quick tutorial on how to chat to Libby, or here's a quick tutorial on how to check out your book yourself, or to retrieve a book from your automated retrieval system. All right, so again, programmer, long-term skills, short-term to medium skills right there, and then very short-term skills there, short, short to medium skills right there. Okay, so future essentials for this. A lot of what we see in robotics is being fed by big data, uh, artificial intelligence. So it's worthwhile to invest in terms of how to do data analysis and processing, right? To understand the data because the data that feeds robotics and artificial intelligence and so forth. Uh, data visualization, uh, also very important. Artificial machine intelligence now it seems intimidating but to understand it is a very good starting point. To understand how a neural network works, or how machine learning works, or how natural language processing works. Not to become the expert in it, but just to understand the context of the, f the, of the environment that you're going to be operating in. User experience and interface design, very important. Libby, biggest drawback on Libby, she's this high, all right? So when people talk to her, they talk down to her like this, <laughs> all right? And then programming, which is a feature essential as well. But again, you would not be expected to code and develop and program the robot. But to understand the context of which you are operating in is very important. All right, just the last bit now on staffing. Change control, very important. You need to manage the change within the environment. If you are going to purchase a robot to replace staff, be very aware of uh, you know, how you're going to deal with that 
what are the new roles that those staff members will be doing, and so forth. Make people aware of the change that is coming. Avoid duplication of service points. I've seen so many times where a self-checkout machine is placed right there, and right next to it is a staff member to assist with the self-checkout. Right, so don't duplicate it because you're spending and investing a lot of money, and you're essentially not relieving staff to look into new roles and responsibilities. You need to automate with the intention of shifting the responsibilities to, to other areas. All right, so skills might reside in another department. You might need to work with ITS. Uh, I see my time is up, so I'm gonna just finish off with this. Uh, the skills might reside in another department. Uh, relieve responsibilities to assign new responsibilities. So Libby's intended purpose was to answer basic queries in the library. All right, and for 2019, Libby has answered 13,000 queries in terms of that. That takes away pressure from the staff at Circulation Desk to tend to more uh, complex queries as you go along. Uh, the automation opens up new possibilities for staff to focus on more data-related services and so forth. You'll hear about some of the other stuff going on. And then the return on investment of the product. Um, uh, the, the last thing I want to say about this is really investigate whether it's going to be worth investing into a specific set of robots or chatbots and so forth. Uh, most libraries are currently trying to lessen their physical collections, read their collections, go more ebooks, right? So you don't necessarily want to spend millions in terms of automated book retrieval on a set of collections that is going to narrow down a bit. Right, so you need to calculate what that return on investment is going to be and if it's going to be worth your while. But just a word of caution that these things are happening and the, the sort of the environment is changing as we go along. All right, so um, new librarian. Uh, we're going to hear a lot about ethics a little bit later. This is just uh, last. I'm not going to go through all of these topics. But what will the new librarian and the library look like? We have environment that knows your history, your patterns, uh, can retrieve books for you, it can train you on different things that you require, it remembers your previous history, it knows your academic performance, you know, based on the information that's available, the interconnected systems, answer your queries, can be accessed via your phone, the chatbot can leave a book, the predetermined location, uh, inventory control, 99% accuracy, and you can drop a book anywhere on campus. All right, so um, I had to rush through this, but please have a look at those things. We're going to hear a little bit later on ethics, which plays a very important role in this, in terms of what data is available and what is being used with regards to academic environments. So that is it. I thank you very much. All right.